This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. You know, the shuttle profile was unique. It was more like a bombing profile. So you'd be about 20 degrees, pointed about a mile and a half short of the runway. And then you would fly that down to 2,000 feet. And then that's where you'd level it off to more of this 1.5 degree approach. And you're targeting 2,500 feet down the runway. And then you target a touchdown at roughly 200 knots. And then we would put out the drag chute and then you'd kick off the chute and roll to a stop at some point down the runway. Pilot Doug Hurley now taking a few seconds of stick time on Atlantis. Atlantis, take air data. Our mission complete Houston, nominal shoot. Final stop. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. This is episode 153, titled Space Flight, and I am your host, Jello, coming to you live from the annual Tailhook Convention and Reunion in Reno, Nevada, where I am catching up with all sorts of old pals, including today's co-host, Matt Arney. Welcome back to the show, Flounder. Thanks, Jello. It's <laughs> wonderful to be here with you and uh, wonderful to be in Reno. Catching up with all kinds of people. Yeah. Well, at least you still have your voice. Somehow, every time I come here, (laughs) my voice gets strained. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe the bourbon helped me out last night. But whatever it is, we're ready to pitch into the fight again today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're taking a break from the excitement to come up here and record because the show must go on. And it's always fun to be in Reno at Tailhook because I don't know about you, but you can't barely walk five feet down the convention floor without meeting someone you knew from flight school or cruised with, or, you know, if you weren't helping me with this, I would have bumped into you. We would have sat and chatted probably for 10 minutes, right? That's right. It is amazing. The people doing different things, people are still in the naval aviation. So Mm -hmm. it's great to connect with them, talk to them about what's going on, people with the different industry representations. And it's always a fun time. Oh yeah. Well, we're having a good time. And I think last time we spoke with you, you were about to go what to the Seattle Sea Fair. How'd that work out? Yeah, that's right. It was a great time, beautiful weather, and I'll tell you, the Blue Angels came into town with the Super Hornets, and they put on an amazing show. I'll bet. I always love seeing them. I think back to my younger days, seeing them in A4s, and then through F-18s, and now in the Super Hornet, and it's really amazing what they do. Great professionals. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing them at Miramar here coming up at the end of the month, so... Once again, for anyone who's listening who might be there, come look for me and check our social media. I'll let you know. I'll pick an airplane that's, uh, if they've got a C5, that's usually an easy one. But I'll put something out there, let you know where I'll be, and hopefully you can come say hello and we can talk about the show and whatever else. But uh, you got any more air shows coming up? No, not for me. Got the kids back in school and so Uh, getting back into a normal kind of routine. All right. Well, and you were starting some new work, I think? Yeah, I'm full time on Monday after the tail hook. So right. yeah, it'll be good to get established in that. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, we're going to keep today's episode somewhat simple because we want to get back to the fun downstairs. We're going to skip any more announcements or listener questions. But I do want to ask you, Flounder. So this was your interview coming up with the retired U.S. Marine Corps Colonel Doug Hurley. And I'm just wondering what made you want to pursue this one? Well, I've always had a bit of fascination with the space program. I can remember key moments of space flight, you know, the first launch. I remember the uh, Challenger and Columbia disasters, and we both have friends who went into NASA, and you had a great interview with Scott Tingle. Mm -hmm. And so a good friend of mine, Chris Cassidy, who I'll talk about a little bit in the episode, we went to the Naval Academy Prep School together. He became a SEAL. He went into NASA. And so we've stayed in touch. So once I started talking to you about doing this and want to look at future topics, I really want to understand what's the future of space flight look like. A lot of people who listen to the show, they might end up joining aviation. And so that's a possible path for them. And my conversation with Pink Floyd in episode 149, we kind of talked a little bit about how naval aviation and warfare and space might start overlapping. So I kind of wanted to see if we could open up that topic. So Doug Hurley was a great guy to do it. Flew the space shuttle twice, helped design the Crew Dragon, Mm -hmm. and was the first guy to fly the Crew Dragon. So I thought he was a great person to try to address that. And as we heard from the little soundbite at the top of the episode, he talks about how to fly and land some of this stuff. So without any further ado, why don't we let you two get to it? Great. Great. 
Hey, welcome, Doug. It's really great to have you on. Look forward to a great conversation about your time at NASA and what the future of spaceflight might be like. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's great to be here, Matt. So if we could, before we get to NASA, could you just give us a few minutes on where you grew up, how you got into naval aviation, and what got you to NASA? Yeah, grew up in upstate New York, a little town called Appalachian. Went to uh, Tulane University on a Navy ROTC scholarship and uh, gravitated towards the Marine option. Took engineering there and graduated in 1988 with a commission as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps and a civil engineering degree and started my career in the Marine Corps and really loved airplanes and flying and thought that that was the way I wanted to go and was lucky enough to get a slot to go to Pensacola. Worked my way through flight school, got winged in 1991 and with an F-18 orders out to the West Coast and then flew for VMFA 225 for about four and a half years on the West Coast, multiple deployments overseas. And then towards the end of that time frame, I uh, had applied to go to Navy test pilot school. I'd gotten some advice from a couple different commanding officers that, hey, if you want to kind of keep this going or perhaps become an astronaut or at least be competitive, test pilot school is probably the way to go. So applied and uh, was accepted and finished my operational tour at the end of 96 and went to test pilot school in uh, 97. Test pilot school takes about a year and then you work as an operational test pilot after that at Pax River in Maryland, VX-23. During that process, I applied to the astronaut corps and got that phone call in July of 2000. Hey, do you want to come down to Houston and work for us? And uh, headed down to Houston that August and spent quite a bit of time down there for the next couple of decades. So how many hours did you end up with in total? I guess that would include T-38 hours from NASA maybe, but what'd you end up with? I mean, Hornet hours, I think I was around a couple thousand. And I think total hours, because we get credit for, I got, I think I have almost 700 hours of shuttle time. Oh, that's awesome. Which is pretty <laughs> cool to have in your logbook. <laughs> yeah. And I've got dragon time, but I think total flight time, I've got to be somewhere close to six or 7,000 hours. I remember it was an odd day. In some sense, it was cool, but in some sense, it was a little bit sad when I ended up surpassing my Hornet hours with T-38 hours. No. That probably also means I was at NASA a pretty long time because it's a lot of 1.1s in a T-38. That's right. <laughs> I had a couple thousand hours in T-38s, but I think I got well over 2,000 in T-38s alone. Yeah. You know, we could get into VX or strike, I think it was then. You go through test pilot school, you go to strike. But I really want to get to NASA time. So real quick, what were your kind of main projects at uh, strike that you did? And then how did the NASA decision come along? Yeah, so at strike, right off the bat, since I was a Hornet guy, I went right into F-18 flight test. So at that time, we were doing basically upgrades for the Hornet. So mostly C and D upgrades, but also we were just starting the engineering, manufacturing and development of F-18 Super Hornet. So we could talk a long time about that, but <laughs> I ended up being the first Marine ever to fly the Super Hornet in flight test. For listeners out there, the Marine Corps never bought onto the Super Hornet program. Right. So they continued to fly C's and D's and they're just phasing out now. But yeah, so you as a Marine pilot, you actually got to fly it and you were the first one. Yeah. And it was a very similar view, I think, from senior leadership in the Navy it was like, hey, the Marines aren't buying it. Why would we have a Marine fly it? That was a bit of a myopic view. And I think our commanding officer at Strike, I had a couple of great COs at Strike. One was a Tomcat guy and then one was a Prowler guy. And they were both fantastic COs. And they just saw it for what it was. It's like, hey, the Marines typically showed up at strike with a lot more flight time than the Navy counterparts in Hornets. And I don't know why that was, but for me personally, it was more like I had a longer operational tour. You know, we had switched from El Toro to Miramar. I was an operational guy for almost four and a half years. Whereas you could have Navy guys maybe with two years, especially if they did the two years, some of them went to PG school and then went to test pilot school. So anyway, I had a ton more flight time and, you know, the common sense approach was, hey, you know, we've got a guy who's got a ton of time in Hornets. It would be value added to Super Hornet. And so 
after we got through the military parochialism, you know, <laughs> I was able to do a bunch of EMD flight tests all across the board, which was really neat. And then towards the end of my tour as a test pilot, I became the operations officer of VX-23, which was incredibly rewarding and challenging. If, you know, we have 200 and some military folks, you know, at least that many contractors, if not more, we had 60 some airplanes. We were doing Super Hornet flight test. We were doing X-32 and X-35, which eventually became F-35. We were doing that fly off. We were starting up flying X-31 again. So, I mean, it was just an incredible time. When I got the call from NASA, that was what I was doing. I was the operations officer there and, and still doing Super Hornet flight tests, but just overseeing all this other stuff, which I think it was a senior captain and I maybe I had just pinned on major. It was pretty neat. You know, and that's one thing about the military, just the amount of responsibility. And, but yeah, then got the call in, in July of 2000 and basically it's like, hey, we want you to come work for us down here in Houston. And so. Yeah. How many times did you apply? That was my first time. You know, it's like a lot of things, but just the timing was such that I really wasn't competitive prior to that because, you know, for a pilot, you know, with me not having a PhD or even an advanced degree at that time, my only avenue into NASA was as a test pilot and typically all but maybe one pilot who's ever been hired at NASA. And I think it was this class that they just picked. Every one of them has been a test pilot. And so the holdover is all the way back from the Mercury days. Mm -hmm. And so the previous class, so the class of 1998 that was picked just prior to my class in 2000, I had just literally finished. In fact, probably when the applications had to go in, I wasn't even done with test pilot school yet. So really didn't make sense to even try to apply then. But yeah, lucked out in some sense, got picked to start. We had to be down there, I think, in August of that year of 2000. That's great. So we had an earlier episode, Maker Tingle, you know, while he was on, he talked a lot about the process and stuff. So some great insight there. So as we go through your NASA career now, transitioning from the Marine Corps into NASA, just some quick highlights. Flew the space shuttle twice. Yes. Yep. Right? Two missions, including the last mission. That's correct. Yeah. STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final flight of the program and on shuttle Atlantis. And then you ended up flying Crew Dragon, which I watched that whole thing with my kids, watching yeah. it go off with uh, Bob Bankin, and uh, it looked like that was a great ride. So let's talk about those 21 years that you did at NASA. How did that go? <laughs> Probably Scott talked about this, Maker. When you get that phone call, as much as you don't think it's going to, it changes your life. I looked at it from the standpoint of, I was seriously considering maybe getting out of the military because I really loved kind of being home and not being deployed. And, you know, having done four deployments previously and was looking square in the eye, a lot more deployments. So it was certainly a consideration. Now it all, obviously it all changed, but then it's like, Hey, you get this phone call. Hey, you, you want to come down to Houston and be an astronaut. So yeah, you just shift gears and you head down there. And when our class showed up, there was a hundred and we made the astronaut office, the largest it's ever been. That ended up being pretty tough in the long term because a vast majority of those people hadn't flown yet. They were picking the two previous classes before ours were over twice the size of our class. And so you just had a bunch of astronauts and they were picking a lot because they thought the flight rate was gonna be high with shuttle and we were gonna be staffing space station. And so they thought that this was a way to kind of manage that. And it's similar, although to a much smaller degree, the way the Navy, you know, flight school, you have these stops and starts as you're going through flight school where you have pools of people and then throughput is low and throughput is high. And they, oh, we think we're gonna need a bunch of pilots and whizzos here. And then they decide they don't. And so it was pretty challenging because I think, frankly, they could have waited and picked us years later, even if you had not known about, obviously they didn't, we didn't know we were going to have an accident in 2003, which just kind of slowed it down even further. Yeah. But really enjoyed it as far as you get pretty close with your class. If I met my future wife, she was a classmate of mine. So I think of the 21 years I spent in Houston, that was the biggest, you know, meeting her and having <laughs> a family was probably the best 
part of it in retrospect, although the flights were certainly huge highlights. Absolutely. So a couple questions in, in all that. One is, so timing wise, your astronaut selection and class in relation to the Columbia mishap in 2003. So were you done with training when that mishap happened? Yeah. So the good question, you know, we started at the end of August in 2000 and we were kind of done with training the end of that following year. So, and Maker probably talked about this too. So you do roughly two years of initial training, you're called an astronaut candidate, and then you move into what we call in our squadrons, you remember this, we called it a ground job. In the astronaut office, it's only slightly fancier. It's called a technical assignment. (laughs) The only difference being is you're flying T-38s, but you're not flying your mission, a space mission yet. So, and those technical assignments involve either operational support or program support. It's probably the most broad way to describe it. And so my first job was as a Cape Crusader is what we called it because we mostly worked down in Florida, even though we were based in Houston, supporting launches and landings. I was one of the astronauts that was in the vehicle prior to launch and in the vehicle after landing and helping manage the operation side of it. So it was a great job. And I started that about a year prior. So Columbia would have been about the seventh flight or eighth flight maybe even more than that. It was quite a few flights. So it was a great year, you know, just really pretty optimistic about things and enjoying your technical assignment, even though there's a lot of travel back and forth between Houston and Florida. And then of course, Columbia was actually the crew that I strapped in. Mm. What I mean by that is one of the jobs you have is Cape Crusader, kind of your graduation exercise is you support all these launches And then you lead one, lead one of the launch campaigns. And mine was STS-107. So you're a member of the closeout crew, the one astronaut member, the closeout crew that straps in the crew. And you're the last one out of the crew module. And then when they land, you're the first one in. And so dealt with that whole, that was not good. And of course, it was Bob and I, ironically, because Bob was also a Cape Crusader. We were on the runway in Florida when, of course, we got a bunch of phone calls saying that, They didn't make it. It was a tough deal. And then, of course, like I said, we could have a podcast just about Columbia. But at that point, much like military aircraft incident or crash, you have a big investigation. And the difference being is we stopped flying for, you know, the better part of two and a half years. Yeah, I remember that. It was a tough time to be an astronaut. It was a tough time going through that process of losing seven friends and, you know, working through that and coming out the other side of it. Bob and I emphasized a lot during our development of Dragon was you don't want to go through that and you want to do whatever you can, whatever your job is to ensure that that doesn't happen again. It was a tough couple of years for sure. That is a a really great segue to one of the things I wanted to get into, which was you and Bob and the development of Dragon. But before we go there, let's talk about piloting the shuttle just for a couple of minutes. Recently, I had my family down at the Museum of Flight, and they had a space shuttle landing simulator. So I had my boys they do? on this simulator side by side. Oh, yeah, it was great. Trying to figure out what a good approach speed and a flight path angle was. But before that, not so much the whole strapping in and all that stuff, but launch to orbit. As a pilot of the shuttle, what were you doing? Your biggest responsibility launch to orbit is the engines, the main engines. Mm. engines 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 the way the crew module was set up is the commander had their systems and the pilot had their systems and you could both fly the vehicle however there were systems that were unique to that side of the cockpit that side of the crew module so on the pilot side you had the engines you had the orbital maneuvering system and the reaction control system you had the apus and you had the electrics And then the commander had the environmental stuff. He had the general purpose computers. We had five computers on board shuttle. And of course, the commander was the de facto pilot, very similar to the airlines. You know, the left seater was the guy ran the show and responsible for the mission. And you, as the pilot, were technically the co-pilot, albeit you did get some opportunities to fly the vehicle, a couple pretty significant ones, which I thought was pretty cool when you're sitting there. And typically those for pilots during the mission, you got to do the undocking and fly around of the space station. And then you got to do part of the manual 
reentry, you got to fly the vehicle prior to the landing. And so that was a pretty cool, memorable experience. I probably said, you know, a not safe for work comment about I'm flying the bleeping space shuttle, <laughs> uh, recording, which my first commander, SCS 127, Mark Polanski, he just got a kick out of that one. But uh, <laughs> That's amazing. So cool because you just spend, and I can't emphasize this enough, you spend so much time in the simulator flying this vehicle and mostly ascent and entry stuff because that's the most dynamic phases of flight. You just have to be ready for so many eventualities. And then, of course, the amount of time we spent in the shuttle training aircraft doing shuttle approaches in a modified Gulfstream. To be eligible to fly as a pilot on the shuttle, you had to have 500 what we call dives or approaches in the shuttle training aircraft before you could even be signed off. 500. 500, just as the co-pilot. Commander had to have 1,000. And that's in uh, the modified Gulfstream. That's not simulations. No, not simulations. Those don't count. And so I can't tell you the amount of time you spend training. And of course, it makes sense, right? The thing's a glider. You got one opportunity to land the thing and you can't mess it up. So Yeah, no bolter. Yeah. So back in that launch to orbit, you said that controlling the engines, like what is controlling the engines? What did it mean in the shuttle? Did you have like a throttle system or was it push button stuff? Yeah. So typically if everything was going well, you were just monitoring very much like an airline pilot would be monitoring. You had the ability to throttle the engines manually, but that was one of the many contingencies you practice. But a nominal ascent would involve you just monitoring the engines, making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know, because the engine start happens at about liftoff minus, I think the number was like five point something seconds. So the engines start, then they throttle up and they do a wellness check with the general purpose computers. And then at T zero, in other words, at the liftoff time, that's when the solid rocket boosters would ignite and then you would lift off. Mm. And then you're monitoring those engines. We would throttle back as we got through maximum aerodynamic pressure. So max Q is what we would call it. So that's kind of in the high 30s to low 40s. The motors would throttle back and then they would throttle back up once we got through the thickest part of the profile. Yeah. So that was your go for throttle up. I remember that in launch. Go for throttle up was one of the calls and that was all automated if it worked properly. But that was a way for the commander to pass back to mission control that, yeah, we're seeing the same thing that you guys are seeing. And then typically they would stay at 104, I think was typically the roughly the throttle percentage number that it would be displayed. And they would stay like that until you got roughly two, two and a half minutes prior to engine shutdown, which the whole profile took eight and a half minutes, give or take on shuttle to get to orbit. And the first two and a half, two minutes and 10 seconds, the boosters would be with you and then they would separate. And then you'd have another six minutes or so before the engines shut down. But a couple minutes prior to engine shutdown, they would start throttling back kind of incrementally. And the reason for that was just the shuttle max G was around three. And that's where you were starting to hit that peak G. So it would just modulate the throttles back. You'd maintain three Gs for like about two minutes. And then, of course, as soon as the engines cut off, then everything's floating and then chaos <laughs> ensues. <laughs> so you're maintaining three Gs for the whole eight and a half minutes or just kind of... No, just for that last couple as the profile starts to shallow out and you're trying to get to that orbital velocity, which is roughly, we call it Mach 25, but it's essentially about 17,500 miles an hour Yeah, is what you need to stay in orbit. And then... The guidance, navigation, and control computers, everybody knows, or they know exactly this. It was described, I think, like as this keyhole. You're shooting for this target in 3D space for the engines to shut down so that that's the point where you start your rendezvous with the space station. And so it's targeting that spot. And as soon as it hits that spot and at that velocity, then you have cutoff. That's the main engine cutoff. Yeah. And so then, uh, or Miko, and then... Yep. At that point, you mentioned the orbital maneuvering system earlier. Yeah. So is that the system then you're using to make the docking happen? The orbital maneuvering system, if folks remember the back end of the shuttle, you could see the three main engines kind of in a triangle. And then there were two other smaller nozzles up on each side of the upper motor. 
and those are the orbital maneuvering engines. So we would use those for the larger orbital burns and then the reaction control systems. There was reaction control jets all over. They were on the wing tips, they were on the back end, they were on the nose. And those would be used for maintaining specific attitudes in space and also for smaller burns that you might need to do as you're rendezvousing or as you're maneuvering. And so, mm-hmm. and we had two sizes of reaction control jets. We had the big RCS jets and then we had smaller jets. And so, and a pilot was responsible for all that stuff and those valves and all those things. You know, that's the thing, a shuttle, it's a 70s era design. And so we had about 2000 switches and circuit breakers in that thing. So <laughs> yeah. as we always said, you were one switch throw away from making your day worse, not better. <laughs> it's right. Really had to be careful and have folks backing you up as you're throwing those switches. Slow hands in the crew module. You betcha. So in order to, like, if you need to flip the shuttle over in orbit or get your attitude, was there some kind of stick control to do that as a pilot or was it yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was a stick control. You could do it manually. You could program it with a digital autopilot and it could do it with the digital autopilot. And then of course, remember you're working with the uniqueness of spacecraft, at least up until Dragon, the spacecraft had a rotational hand control and translational hand control. So one did translate up, down, left, right, in, out, and the other one would change your roll, pitch, and yaw. So you have ability to do both manually if you need to. But typically, your attitude was controlled by the digital autopilot, and then you could make inputs with the translational controls. That's how we docked and undocked. That's how we would do smaller burns on orbit. And then typically, we did not do a lot of rotational flying. We just typed in the roll, pitch, and yaw. It was like an Euler sequence, I believe, is what it was, um, if anybody remembers that, <laughs> way back in physics. But you would type in roll, pitch, and yaw with the digital autopilot, and then the vehicle would fix to that attitude. And there were other things you could do on orbit, like you could put a certain axis towards the sun if you were trying to maximize power from the solar panels, or you could put, like, for example, the night before we would come back in for landing, we would typically put the bottom of the orbiter towards the sun so we could get the max amount of cooling on the vehicle and get it as cold as we could prior to re-entry. So there was just different things like that. But you certainly did a fair amount of translational manual flying. Both the commander and the pilot did that, and depending on what the phase of flight was. And certainly when we were in close proximity to space station, it was all manual. Mm, It was all manual then as you were lining that up. And so if you did get a chance to play which I'm sure you didn't, what kind of roll rate would you have in an aileron roll with the space shuttle up there in orbit? <laughs> you know, and I know a couple of guys that probably did that in the sim, and you could get some pretty sporty roll rates with the bigger jets. Yeah. You didn't really want to do that during a manual ascent because you probably not survived the maneuver. The sim would probably tell you there's no way you could do that with the boosters <laughs> attached and that kind of stuff. But Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's pretty, you know, for a... 250,000 pound vehicle, it had plenty of authority, I would say. We did some of that in the sim. We obviously never did that in flight. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you mentioned docking all manual, and I want to kind of set the stage to compare or what you did to develop Crew Dragon. So what was your docking? Because both your shuttle missions were space station missions, right? Space station assembly missions. Yeah, the docking and undocking, like I said, was all manual. We would dock on what we call the V-bar. So that is basically the vector of the nose of the space station as it works its way through space. And so you would come up and drive along that axis. And actually, we were kind of oriented such that like the nose was up, tail was down, payload bay was facing the space station, and you kind of drove it in that way. And you could adjust your flight control orientation based on that particular maneuver such that it made sense intuitively what you were doing with the controls. And like I said, it was mostly maintaining a given rate, a pretty low rate of closure between you know the shuttle and space station because you have two very massive vehicles in space and both of them are going about 17,500 miles an hour. So you don't want to have a big delta between them because that impact as you dock You know, you just think about a million pounds of space station and 250,000 pounds of space shuttle. You want to make it very gentle, like docking a big boat. Yeah. 
it's a very slow closure rate. And then you're controlling, you know, your vertical, you know, your attitude is maintained by the digital autopilot, like I said, and you're just controlling closure and then up, down, left, right. And if you need to speed up your closure or slow down your closure, we had a window that we would target and yeah, you just corrected it. There was a centerline camera that you would fly to and it was very slow, very methodical, but... And about what kind of closure do you recall you were kind of targeting? It was like 0.08 to 0.12 yeah. meters per second, I believe, or feet per second. I can't remember which it was. I can't remember what our units we used for shuttle, but it was a very, very small targeted closure. And that was all based on the mass of the two vehicles and then the capability of the docking system. But yeah, it was always... 0.08 to 0.12 is what we were targeting somewhere in between there. And so most people flew it, you know, right at 0.1 because that was easy. And I think Dragons was pretty similar to that, although in Dragon, we definitely were metric. And then there would be, you'd get indications of contact and capture, and then hooks would start turning and it would take a while to go through that process and get both vehicles locked up and all the residual motion kind of dampened. And that was part of the docking system would do that. And obviously with these big vehicles, it took a little while because they're just really big vehicles. And so, yeah, you mentioned it's similar to like docking a boat. Unfortunately on YouTube, we can see all kinds of examples how that didn't work out so well. <laughs> <But> <laughs> a very measured, slow, yeah. incremental docking of a boat where you like, it's not your boat and you're docking it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to, you know, hand it back to the owner with a bunch of scratches or worse. That's just right. point to the spot where the boat used to be, but it's now at the bottom of the harbor. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's similar to formation flying with a jet. Yeah, you're going really fast together, but the closures between the two aircraft as you're rendezvousing, for example, is pretty small, unless you're the Blue Angels, and then those guys practice that stuff a lot. Relative speed is between the vehicles was very small. You know, it had to be that way. And then the docking mechanism, you said things would start turning and stuff. Automatic? Yep. Typically, it was automatic, although you had to initiate certain sequences, and there were ways to do it much more manually. But typically, it was a case of, it was a pretty laborious checklist because the docking mechanism on shuttle was added later, and I think it was a Russian system, technically. That all had to be somehow incorporated into the vehicle. So there was some buttons you had to push that were mechanical. And then there were sequences that you had to initiate with the general purpose computers and be in the right mode and all that stuff. And you could monitor it. So it was somewhat manual, I would say, is probably the best way to describe it. And that's the way, frankly, when I flew shuttle, that's the way it kind of was. It wasn't initially ever designed to do what we were doing with it. There were a lot of like little modifications or add-on equipment that we had on the flight deck or on the aft flight deck that we used that had been added later on. And so the integration wasn't as clean as it could be. And so there was a lot of, I mean, you probably saw pictures. There was just a lot of cables and hmm. camera monitors that were added on and extra computers, laptop computers that we would have to run things on. And just because the shuttle didn't initially ever have that designed into it. The ingenuity to add those systems, but it puts the burden on the operators to integrate. Reminds me of the Tomcat in the later days. Well, I was just going to say, I, it's very similar to airplanes as they aged and you're adding stuff to it. And you have mission computers dump and you have, you know, you've got to do the control alt delete or the power cycle of the left generator, which is what we often did in the Hornet. Cycle the left generator and somehow that would fix things. And it was not completely different in the shuttle towards the end of the program, just because we had equipment on board, we had science that we had on board, we had a docking mechanism and trying to get extra camera views and the way we could do that and what the shuttle had built in. And I mean, it helped a lot, but there was a lot of overhead trying to make all that stuff work and keep it running. So then you undock, you're getting ready for landing, you got to flip it over, slow it down so you can deorbit burn that it was. Yeah, your deorbit burn is essentially facing backwards. And that's where I talked about those orbital maneuvering engines. They're the bigger engines. They slow you down about, it's only a few hundred miles an hour. That allows your orbital decay such that you re-enter. Yeah, typically we would fire that deorbit burn roughly somewhere over the Indian Ocean, Western Australia, that kind of area. 
And then, you know, 55 minutes later, you'd land at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, that's amazing. So you landed both times at Kennedy. You didn't land out in the desert. We landed at Kennedy both times. First time, first attempt, which was pretty cool. Going up on SDS-127, I think we scrubbed five or six times over the course of uh, over a month. So it was tough getting up, but coming back both times was first attempt, which was really nice. Did you fly with Chris Cassidy on that one? Chris Cassidy was on my first flight. Yeah, we flew together. Yeah. I think I was at Cape Canaveral for one of those launches that got scrubbed. It was supposed to be the middle of the night launch. Somebody came by our hotel room and said, hey, they're not going, so just keeps leaving. Yeah. Our first launch campaign was in June of 2009. And yeah, it was like we were on the vampire ship. I think launch was like at two or three in the morning and it was scrubbed, I think, three times. We had mechanical issues with an umbilical that connected from the launch tower to the external tank that was leaking and it was hydrogen. And of course, that's not good. And Mm. yeah, we tried two or three times in June and then came back in July and tried a couple times and then finally launched the middle of uh, right around the 15th of July when we finally launched. But yeah, Chris was MS-1. So he sat right behind me on the flight deck. And which shuttle was that? That was Endeavour, the youngest or newest shuttle. Yeah. So bring an Endeavor or Atlantis into land. Yeah. You got the deorbit burn, you're coming down. And so what's the piloting land in the shuttle? Piloting doesn't start until you're kind of right about subsonic, give or take. Like I said, you're slowing from Mach 25 down to your landing speed is roughly 200 knots. So you're going 17,500 down to, you know, a little over 200 miles an hour. Yeah, the piloting takes place essentially when you get on what we call the heading alignment cone or heading alignment circle. You kind of imagine it this way. There's like a Dixie cup that is at the runway. And then what you fly around is this heading alignment cone. You fly some portion of that to get lined up with whatever runway you're going to land at. So at Kennedy, we had runway 15 and 33. I think both times we landed 15, but maybe I'm not remembering it right. And so you would have somewhere around 180 degrees or maybe a couple hundred degrees on the hack. That would all be hand flown all the way from there all the way down to when you stopped. It would basically click off the autopilot and the commander would get it on the hack. Then he'd hand it to the pilot. The pilot would fly a vast majority of the hack. And then about, I don't know, just before you turn final, pilot would hand it back off to the commander and then you would intercept final at roughly 12 or 14,000 feet. You know, the shuttle profile was unique. It was more like a bombing profile. So you'd be about 20 degrees Mm -hmm. pointed about a mile and a half ish short of the runway. And then you would fly that down to 2000 feet and you would do what we called pre-flare. And then that's where you'd level it off to more of this 1.5 1.5 degree approach and then we'd pick up which was very similar to what we had at the ship so that's why it, the navy and the marine guys adjusted pretty well to landing the shuttle because you had we called it a ball bar instead of the ball but it was very much a visual glide slope indicator on the side of the runway and you would fly that and you're targeting a couple thousand 2500 feet down the runway give or take it depended a lot on your cg and your landing weight and then you would target a touchdown at roughly 200 knots at that 25 to 3,000 feet down the runway. Of course, you had a 15,000 foot runway, so it was pretty big. The gear would come down at 200 feet, two or 300 feet. Was that a manual function? Yeah, that was something the pilot did. You had to arm it and then drop it. And it came down pretty fast and there was a bunch of redundancy. So it was pretty reliable. We never had a gear problem in the history of the program. So you got pretty nose down. You saw like a bombing profile. I mean, what kind of descent, what kind of attitude are you at and speed for that part of it? Yeah. So you're 20 degrees nose low. The shuttle maintained speed because obviously it's a glider with the speed brake, which was essentially the vertical tail would split and it would modulate to control your airspeed at roughly 300 knots. And then, like I said, you hit that pull up point at about 2000 feet. We called the pre-flare and then You would basically, it's mostly back stick as you're trying to maintain glide slope as you're slowing from 300 down to a touchdown of about 200. And then we would put out the drag chute at about the time the nose 
because there was a derotation just about the time the nose came through horizontal and to cushion the nose gear touchdown, the chute would be timed such that the chute, the drag chute would be fully inflated to kind of ease that. And then you'd kick off the chute and roll to a stop at some point down the runway. And then all the post-flight activity starts. Yeah, then there's a whole bunch of people driving up to the vehicle. and Oh, that's great. So you take all that experience. You'd been in NASA for like nine or so years, or no, 11 or so years at that point when you landed Atlantis for the last shuttle mission. Yeah. Meanwhile, a little later on, SpaceX is going to get started. So how did all that translate into Crew Dragon and your efforts in Crew Dragon to shape that? Yeah, so we got back from shuttle in 2011. And, you know, our post flight, because it was the last shuttle flight, took quite a while. You know, we flew in July of 2011, and we probably didn't finish our post flight till almost the end of that year. You know, it makes sense. But certainly, there were times after we landed, it's like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> and certainly, I wasn't unique. You know, there were several people at NASA, astronauts that were like, you know, okay, I came here to fly space shuttle and now we're going to have to fly on Soyuz for a while and we really don't know what's next. It was more in the back of my mind than anything. You know, my wife, we knew we were both assigned roughly the same time. So when I got assigned to fly on SDS-135, she was assigned to be an expedition crew member on Expedition 36 and 37 with Chris, which was going to happen basically in 2013. That's the Soyuz up to the space station for six months. And roughly a five to six month expedition. And at that point, we'd been married and had our son. He was really young at the time. It was about a year and a half, I think, when I flew on 135. So, you know, for me, leaving NASA wasn't really, you know, I certainly was starting to think about, okay, what do we do next? But the job at hand was now to be the ground support for my wife when she flew in 2013. So... But anyway, in about, so this is after my wife got back in 2014 timeframe, the commercial crew program had awarded the final contracts to SpaceX and Boeing. At that point, I was working in what we would call senior management in the astronaut office. I was an assistant director at flight operations or flight crew operations, which that is a big directorate at Johnson Space Center. And one of their divisions that they own is the astronaut office. Another one is the air operations guys. Another one is the mission operations, which is the flight directors and the flight controllers. So the big boss at the time had asked me, hey, are you interested in flying again? You know, I was pretty honest, probably a lot more honest than most astronauts are because astronauts are pretty coy about what they want to do next. (laughs) And so I said, yeah, if it's not what I just did, you know, because Karen had just done a six month ISS expedition, I was not necessarily interested in doing that, you know, and doing that to our family again, because it's, it's like a military deployment, you know, your spouse is gone for six plus months and yeah, but no port calls. Yeah, it's a challenge. So anyway, it ended up Bob and I and Sonny Williams and Eric Bowe were selected in 2015 to be the first, what they called the cadre for the commercial crew mission. So the intent was we would fly the test flights for the commercial crew program and with either Boeing or SpaceX. And at the beginning, we were agnostic. In other words, we were supporting both companies as they were kind of working their way through developing these vehicles. And then ultimately, Bob and I ended up heading out to California a lot. (laughs) So still living in Houston, just going the other direction from Canaveral to California through SpaceX. Yeah, when we were, I think, officially named, which I think was in 2018, that summer, they kind of named the first two crews in each for each company. From that point on until we flew, barring the COVID that started a few months before we flew, we were out in California pretty much every week, living out there, and then we'd come home on the weekends. So people can see some of the background in this. In the, What was the Netflix Return to Space? Yeah, Return to Space. Yeah, they did a pretty nice job of capturing, at least it gives it a pretty good flavor of what we experienced and what some of those folks at SpaceX kind of went through. And it gives a perspective, kind of a lot of different perspectives, which I thought was really good. It captured things really well from at least that 2018 time frame until we flew. And you guys flew, it was 2020, right after COVID had kicked off. 
Yeah, we launched on May 30th, 2020. We had an attempt on the 27th and we scrubbed for weather, which is not a big surprise when you're launching in the middle of the day in Florida in the late spring, early summer. And then everything came together three days later on the 30th. Yeah, I love the comment I heard in Return to Space after that scrub. It was another chance to check everything. It really seemed like, going back to your previous comment, everybody was intent on astronaut safety, including the ability to egress, the ability to abort, taking the lessons of Columbia and shuttle experience. And also, did you have any Soyuz experience as far as going over to Russia and participating in missions or in the launch in Kazakhstan? Yeah, I did in a couple different scenarios. So one of the jobs that we have as a technical assignment astronauts have is as the director of operations in Russia, better known as the DOR. I spent almost a year and a half over there as the DOR in just prior to starting training for STS-127, so 06, 07 timeframe. And then for STS-135, because there was no shuttle to rescue us, if we'd had problems with our heat shield, Mm. a la Columbia, we would have been required to come back on Soyuz's over the following year because it would have taken four Soyuz's, which would have taken a year to get all four of us back. And I apparently drew the short straw and I would have had a longer mission than (laughs) any U.S. astronaut had that happened. That's right. So I'm kind of glad it didn't. I'm sure my wife is too. So we did get some orbit and entry training as well as some centrifuge and vacuum chamber training on Soyuz, but no formal crew training other than that. Okay. So what was your role in helping SpaceX develop its system for Crew Dragon? Literally, you know, it's very much like we were as test pilots, given it rationale, the operational litmus test, being there to help when they had questions, suggest solutions, and then evaluate where we were, you know, certainly within our lane. We weren't there to tell them, hey, this is the type of engine you need to use, and this is the type of rocket you need to build. It was more like, okay, this is what we would need to be successful inside the crew module. This is what it's like when you've launched. This is what it's like when you're in orbit. Simple things like probably could use Velcro here. We could probably use Velcro here, where we store stuff, what the procedures look like, what the displays look like, how the vehicle flies, just all of that. So you're just that operational litmus test for how the vehicle performs and being able to accomplish the mission that it was designed to do and what NASA is paying SpaceX and Boeing to do, which is to take four astronauts from Kennedy Space Center take them up to space station, dock at space station, remain there for six months, give or take, and then safely get them back to earth with some cargo and with some payloads. We were the test pilots. You know, the difference was we were the ones that were the face of NASA in a lot of respects to that company. And so we took it pretty seriously. We knew SpaceX, especially back then, looked at the world a little differently than NASA did. Mm -hmm. And I'll be really honest with you, there were not very many people at NASA that thought SpaceX would be successful in this particular endeavor. And so that added a giant chip to my shoulder. And from that point on, I was like, we are going to do this. We're going to be successful. And it's like any other team, maybe at that point where SpaceX lacked human spaceflight experience, they'd already had a fair amount of rocket experience getting stuff into space. And I had a bunch of smart people. And then the team that we had, the NASA team was relatively small, some by virtue of the fact that people didn't want to go to California every week. That's hard. The Boeing group was based in Houston. So anyway, it was just good old fashioned hard work. And then I think the other part of it was Bob and I certainly had the benefit, even within the astronaut office, of being two test pilot school graduates that had actually done a major test program as test pilots. You know, I did Super Hornet. Bob was a test conductor for F-22. And so we just knew that these things, they're not easy. They're not smooth. You have setbacks. You know, it's one step up, two steps back. Stuff breaks. You're not going to make these dates. You know, NASA just didn't have anybody, certainly with any of that corporate history of experience, because last time they'd done a human spaceflight program, it was shuttle. Yeah. 
for listeners out there, who, younger listeners who are just used to, you know, was it Falcon 9 boosters landing side by side and all this kind of cool stuff that goes on nowadays, launching a rocket into space is hard and it takes a long time to figure it out, even today. You know, they blew up a rocket. It was a space station cargo mission. They blew that up in 2015 or 16. Major anomaly. We had some smaller failures during testing with engines and with other systems. And then they had another major explosion of the DM-1. So the uncrewed test flight had occurred in, I think, January of 2019. And it was, by any measure, a complete and utter success. They had almost nothing, not even like off nominal. Four months later, they're doing a ground test at Cape Canaveral of the essentially what we call the Super Dracos or the abort engines if you needed to do an abort away from the rocket. And they blew the capsule up into so many little pieces. And so you're just sitting there going, wow, what do we do now kind of thing? And they figured some stuff out. So it was worth it. But those types of setbacks, there were a lot of people at NASA that just didn't handle those very well. Mm -hmm. And you just had to stay the course. SpaceX was very open with us about what they thought happened and what they learned. And we worked through all those things and got to the pad about a year later. You know, there were other challenges with parachutes and, you know, it's like developing a brand new vehicle is essentially starting from the drawing board and getting it to a point where you're flying in a matter of years is challenging, but they did it. So piloting that, flying that vehicle, launch to orbit, presume pretty automated as far as piloting is concerned for Crew Dragon. The Crew Dragon was built to be completely automated, start to finish. The NASA requirements were there. There were certain phases of flight, mostly in orbit and around the space station, where you had to have a manual backup. And we were obviously highly and heavily involved in that part of the development. And then, of course, I may be the only person that ever actually manually flies Dragon ever. If it works the way it's supposed to, no one will ever have to manually fly Dragon again, but because ours was the first flight and test flight, that was part of the test program was to manually fly Dragon a couple times. And the amazing thing is it flew just like the simulator. But the unique thing was we flew it on a touchscreen. That was interesting because I remember years before we were talking about how are we going to fly this vehicle and the astronauts just assume we would have those controllers I told you about for shuttle, a translational hand controller and a rotational hand controller. But Elon didn't want to have, he wanted to have a nice clean crew module and those hand controllers weren't aesthetically pleasing. I see. The challenge he gave to his team was, why can't we fly it with a touchscreen? Why can't we do this? And why can't we do that? And of course, you're sitting there as a pilot going, hmm, this isn't going to be easy. <laughs> and I'm not sure I like this, but that was one thing I think both Bob and I really worked hard at and prided ourselves at was to be able to, okay, sure, show me what you got. Let's see what your concept is. And, and in the end, you know, they made it work. And it was not an easy solution because you had to make it work with your hands where your hands were doing the touchscreen. You had to make it work if you were wearing your spacesuit, wearing gloves. Mm-hmm. And you had to make sure that it wasn't like your iPhone where it would lock up or it would get stuck on a pulse or it would do this or it would do that. But in the end, like I said, it flew exactly like the simulator flew. It was just amazing. I remember looking at Bob going, this is just like the sim, except we're actually in space. Yeah. It was really neat, but flew much differently, obviously, than shuttle, you know, one, because it was a much smaller vehicle and it was much obviously more modern. So for example, like when we were flying it manually, the camera was synthesized on your display, the same display where you're flying the vehicle, you're looking through the docking camera and you can see the space station and the docking cross and all the things you need to do in order to fly it accurately. Whereas in the shuttle, you were looking at like three different things to do the same task. Back to our previous comment about adding systems on instead of designing it all in right at the start. Yeah. And just the computing power of what was available in 2018 and what was available in 1980. It's a little bit different. Yeah, that's right. The capability and the, how the displays work and your interface with the displays. And they did an impressive job considering. 
And then recovery to splashdown landing, all automated as well, as long as everything goes well. It's kind of the same thing. Everything was automated. You had the ability to manually undock and get it away from space station, and you could get it to a point where it would be able to re-enter. But then it would have to fly the re-entry automated. You also had the capability of manually putting out the drogue chutes and the main chutes and a few other things. There were some requirements by NASA and kind of safety requirements. You certainly need the chute to work. If it doesn't work from an automated standpoint, you certainly need to be able to manually put the chute out. So those types of things are available, but the design was automated start to finish. Mm -hmm. In the, um, I think for launch and then undocking, I recall in that return to space, there was a confirmed visors down. So you guys are wearing these spacesuits that were also designed by SpaceX, right? You bet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. There were certain times flying in the jet that you had to have your visor down, just protecting from in case you get some kind of extraneous uh, command input and you're bashing your face against the console or. No, it's all about pressure barriers. Yeah. Okay. When you're in a dynamic phase of flight, that launch and entry suit, that suit we were wearing maintains your atmosphere pressure. So in case you had, for example, whenever we were close to space station or as we were coming back through re-entry, you know, and of course, ascent, where there would be the opportunity to have a leak of the spacecraft where you would lose pressure, you could still survive. So you could survive in those suits. You bet. That's the whole reason we wear those pressure suits is to maintain. Now, you know, if it was a complete, the vehicle goes to vacuum, then, you know, there certainly is a time limit. It's pretty generous as far as the vehicle being able to maintain the suit pressure and maintain your oxygen and all those things. But it's really just as that second layer of pressure barrier. And so you better get back to atmosphere pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. And that's another advantage of having an automated vehicle is ideally it can get you back because if you're really down to vacuum inside the spacecraft, that suit is inflated to a point where you're not going to be able to do very much with the suit. It is very rigid and very stiff. And so just moving it a little bit to actuate something manually would be difficult, not impossible, but pretty difficult. And so uh, that was the same reason we had those orange suits in space shuttle was the same thinking. You know, if you had a, a massive decompression or you micrometeor came through pressure barrier and you lost pressure, had a pressure leak of some sort, you know, hatch wasn't sealed properly or whatever, or was damaged, then you had a way to get to the ground and keep the crew alive. Awesome. Well, let's go to the future of space flight. Okay. You've retired from NASA. Yep. And so from your seat now, what's the future of space flight looking like? And you also, previous to this, we were talking Lance Floyd Pink, who we had on talking about the future of air warfare. We talked about how some of air warfare might end up, there's a potential to leak into low Earth orbit. Yeah. Because the space station, I saw, it's only, what, 227 miles above the Earth, approximately? It's probably a little higher than that now. It's probably in the 240s to 250s. At least that's where it was a couple of years ago when I was there. Yeah. We had it a little lower than that when we were building it because it was just easier to get those heavy payloads a little bit lower. You know, it was easier on shuttle from a performance standpoint, take up those bigger pieces. But yeah, it's only 250 miles up. But, you know, the way I look at it from a future standpoint, I just look at what has happened just with Dragon since we've flown. What do we got? The third or fourth NASA crew is up there now, has flown since we've flown. We've had two quote unquote private missions of Dragon flown. So like six human flights of Dragon in roughly two years. And then just, you know, seeing Virgin, they've done some suborbital flights. They've done a couple, I think. Blue Origin's done a number of them. And so I think from that standpoint, you know, it's just kind of exponential, just the access to space in a sense, albeit the other side of it is you've either got to have a heck of a big bank account if you're going to do it on your own, mm -hmm. or you've got to be sponsored by an organization or a country or an agency in order to do it. So I think we've got a ways to go there before it becomes like airline travel, but I'm impressed with kind of the speed with which it's happening. Just as you mentioned, the military application of space, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface there and what might be 
commercial space stations Mm -hmm. because the ISS isn't going to be up there forever. So there's already plans and works for commercial space stations. And then from my perspective, working for North of Grumman is, you know, we're getting ready to fly a rocket to the moon for the first time in a long, long time with the intent of flying humans back to the moon in the not too distant future. And then ultimately the stated goal by NASA is to put humans on Mars. So I think it's just, I couldn't quote the numbers, but the numbers that you hear that are of the money going in and being invested in space and human space is eye-watering at this point. You know, the venture capitalist side of things and private corporations are doing and what countries are doing. And so I'm amazed with what has happened just in the last two years with human spaceflight and how many more people have gone into space in just the last couple of years and what that is going to look like a decade or two from now, where potentially maybe a couple decades from now, we would have people on their way to Mars. Yeah. And so a couple of decades from now, we're talking 2040s that we could be doing that. And other than just the desire for exploration, at some point, something's got to be happening that is, I think, more like, I mean, we can look at resources available and all those kinds of things. But the complexity of even taking people and craft out there, if you want to bring stuff back, I mean, there's just so much complexity to that equation that I just can't comprehend it. That's the thing, you know, whatever is going to happen, I mean, you can already sort of see that with this campaign with Artemis going to the moon. It's much broader in a sense than maybe what it was like for Apollo, which was literally the United States is going to put people on the moon before the Soviet Union does. I mean, it was a space race, right? Mm. You know, now we have a number of countries involved with Artemis, a number of partners similar to the partners in some cases that we have for the International Space Station. And like you said, the complexity and the cost is probably going to prohibit that type of program like we had with Apollo. It's going to be this public-private partnership. It's going to be countries partnering with other countries. It's going to be individuals. It's going to be companies like SpaceX, like Boeing, like Northrop Grumman, like Blue Origin, like Axiom, that everybody is going to have to do their part and contribute to this mission to go to Mars because literally the technological complexity and cost, you're not going to have one, certainly NASA just politically is not going to be able to get that type of budgetary and then long-term support to maintain a program that is going to be required to go to Mars because it's going to take a decade or two just to develop the vehicles and the infrastructure needed in order to launch that and get things in place on Mars or, or whether it's things, orbital depots, or however you're going to logistically support these missions, whether it's launch stuff to Mars and land it there and then have the crew go or have something in orbit and depots and the moon and whatever you're going to do from a mission design standpoint, it's going to take a huge effort globally. I just don't think it's going to be, hey, NASA's going to go to Mars. It just isn't going to happen. I mean, you know, in my career as an astronaut, we've had three moon programs and this one looks like it's finally going to make it. Mm -hmm. It's because of this huge amount. It's got to last through presidential administrations and it's got to have international support. And it's also got to have that financial support that comes with that type of international support to have any chance of being successful. And that's notwithstanding all the technical challenges that you have to overcome in order to keep people alive for two and a half years going from Earth to Mars keeping them alive on the surface of Mars and then getting them back home safely. Cause I'm certainly not the guy that's going to go do the one way mission. I mean, maybe somebody else will, but it doesn't look good when people die in space. Trust me. That's right. Absolutely. You mentioned, you know, partnerships, countries have to work together. I recently read that Russia has stated they're going to pull out of the state station in 2024 yeah. per, I guess, an agreement. China also, I believe is building their own space station. It's got their own space program. Yep. And with the European Space Agency, some pretty big movers as we continue to partner with ESA. I don't want to go into dramatization of conflict in space, but it's going to get busy up there in low Earth orbit. What's your prognosis for how people are working together to make sure that we don't have some kind of you know, mishap just from things running into each other up there? That low Earth orbit 
regime has certainly gotten crowded with all the different things that are up there. And we have the capability to track a lot of that stuff. Certainly, we've had opportunities. In fact, when Chris and I and Bob were up there in 2020, we had to do an avoidance maneuver for a rocket body that was up there from somebody that, you know, sometimes things get launched like from China and from Russia that there really isn't maybe the consequences of a test may not be thought through when it comes to low earth orbit because it's easy for stuff to get up there and then it takes a long time for that stuff to decay or burn up. Yeah, it is becoming crowded and that's a risk that we take and are going to continue to take in that area, the two to 400 mile above the earth's surface. You know, the best way to manage that is this international cooperation. And I think for the most part, we've done really well. However, you know, it's not perfect. And certainly we're seeing some challenges geopolitically with Russia right now because of the Ukrainian conflict. And for different reasons, we've never really made any agreements with China. And I know ESA has, the European Space Agency, I know we had ESA astronauts training in China with the potential for them to go fly on the Chinese space station. So I optimistically think that the world is going to recognize the challenges that we have in space and hopefully work together. You know, and we saw that on space station, working with the cosmonauts was just a great experience. They were just like us and just wanted to do a good job and keep the space station flying and believed in the effort and what we were doing up there. But sometimes the politics back here on earth get in the way and that's disappointing, but Mm. it is going to be a challenge that only gets greater if we continue to kind of go down the road that we seem to be going down now. And I'm hoping the Russians change their minds or at least what we heard initially is maybe a little bit over dramatic, but you know, I think time will tell because I think there's a lot of pushing and pulling within Russia right now that we don't know about, you know, from that standpoint, because there certainly is a part of the Russians that want to maintain this cooperation that we've had with the International Space Station. But those relationships with the cosmonauts, that's really came out in that Among the Stars series that Chris Cassidy was in that you and Bob had a role in as well. Yeah. But it was really interesting seeing that relationship as people between astronauts. Yeah, it's a human experience. And I mean, you know, the politics, they never come up. And I mean, it's emphasized while you're up there. I mean, you know, you go orbit around the Earth, you know, in 90 minutes. And if you do a daylight pass, you look down, there's no borders down there. You know, you don't experience that. You can hear it on CNN or you get it on email when you're up there. But that type of conflict just doesn't exist on space station. And it doesn't exist in space for the most part. And you hope it stays that way. So we can wrap up with a couple listener questions yeah. and a couple close out. So a uh, YouTuber sent me a question. When is someone going to put some spin on spacecraft to mimic some semblance of microgravity? I imagine on a long voyage to Mars, it sure would be nice for eating and working out. That is, you know, like we talked about, one of the big technological challenges for me, and obviously you're the human in the loop, you're the, the soft pink body that's going into space. <laughs> I've seen all the detrimental effects that spaceflight has on the human body. My wife and I have both experienced it and it takes a long time to recover. Now you do, but the biggest reason is, well, there's two, in my opinion. One is microgravity just isn't the best thing for the human body. So you've got to do a whole bunch of things to mitigate that. And that when we do that in space, but being able to generate gravity, would be huge, whether it's with a propulsion system that is technologically advanced so you can go fast enough where you're generating gravity, or like you see in some of the movies where there's a rotational part of the spacecraft that maintains a gravity field. And then the other one is radiation. That's something that's seldom discussed, but something we're going to have to seriously address because the amount of radiation that a human body given what we have in spacecraft and what we currently design spacecraft for today going to Mars and back, you're going to be exposed to a radiation that would almost guarantee that you would get cancer at some point subsequent to going. Now, somebody would say, well, I'll take my chances. But the point is, is that how we do that and how we design spacecraft. And once again, for me, it always gets back to the speed at which you can get from here to Mars. The faster you can get there, you minimize your exposure to radiation. You also potentially generate gravity and you solve two problems. But technologically, that's a huge challenge. 
it's not like you can just go to your local healthcare station on Mars and take care of your cancer. I mean, if you're going to be any period of time, we got to make sure people are staying healthy. Yeah, we got to protect our people. We owe them that much. Yeah. And then Scott Morris asked, it seems that the space station requires substantial effort to keep the mission going, seeing that it is relatively close. How is space exploration going to be sustained outside of LEO? And I think we've kind of talked about a lot of that stuff, but any other thoughts on that one? That's the intent. And that's kind of as a test pilot, that's what I always thought going back to the moon. I think scientifically, we've just scratched the surface. So from a scientific standpoint, we absolutely should have gone back to the moon a decade or two ago. Mm. That notwithstanding, that's the other thing we need to do when we go to the moon is figure out what we need when we're two or three days from the moon and not six to nine months from Mars is figure out all those things that we need to do to be self-sufficient and to be supplied and to try those things out and test those things out while we have a human presence on the moon, kind of like we've done with space station. It's just like, what stuff breaks? What stuff needs to be improved technologically? What do we need to grow? That's the whole thing with space flight is all the stuff that you need to have to keep a human alive in space. It's a lot of stuff. You should see all the stuff we have on space station, food, clothing, towels, soap, razors, water, all that stuff that you need to keep people alive. We got to figure out how to do it very efficiently or be able to grow it or be able to manufacture it after we get out there or when we're there. We got to have 3D printing on steroids because I mean, you break something, you might not have the part for it. I can't make a phone call to the earth and go, hey, can you send me up a new widget? And they're like, yeah, it'll be there in a year. It'll Mm. be there in nine months. So that kind of stuff we need to get really sorted out while we're working on the moon. And is the moon a perfect analog for Mars? No, but I'll tell you what, it's pretty darn good considering. And you're three days away if something really bad happens while you're testing all this stuff out. So you can probably get people home or keep them safe while we figure out how to rescue them. Wow. That's a lot there. Yeah. So we said you retired last year. You're working for North Grumman now. So what's next for you and Karen and family? Thanks for asking. So yeah, the family just got out here in June. We sold our house in Texas. I started working here at North Grumman after the school year in Texas started. So I was doing the back and forth for a while, but now we have the whole family out here and my son is actually starting school here in Utah in a couple of days. So yeah, it's nice to have everybody out here. We love living in the mountains. We're living outside of Park City here in Utah. It's a huge change, but you know, the team out here at Northrop Grumman, it used to be ATK. So that's the company that built the solid rocket boosters for shuttle. So there's a huge space heritage out here. It's about 3000 employees and the culture of the company and the team is just amazing. I just really love working out here and working for these people. And we support not only human space flight, because now we're building boosters for Artemis. So for the space launch system, SLS, which is, you know, essentially heritage boosters that we had for shuttle, but they're bigger, more thrust. And then we also support a lot of military solid rocket propulsion with the Trident missiles and the D5 for submarines and other smaller missiles and follow-ons. And so it's like being able to support human space flight and the military, it's just pretty cool and kind of maybe a perfect place for me to land after my Marine and NASA career. So, and like I said, from selfish standpoint, we've always wanted to live in the mountains and (laughs) we finally got here after 50 some years. So pretty neat. That's wonderful. And one of the questions that we always ask is uh, what's your call sign and where does it come from? I think we can figure (laughs) yours out pretty easily. Yeah, it's a long story in a sense, but, you know, my last name is Hurley. So Hurl, my call sign's Chunky. Just put it this way. There was a cross country when I was a brand new F-18 pilot to New Orleans, which is where I went to college. And let's just say we didn't spend a lot of time in our hotel room sleeping. I'll just put it that way. Because you were at church. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we were doing some volunteer work and we were doing some community relations. Yeah. And it stuck with me. And, you know, it's funny, especially when I got to NASA, you know, an astronaut class, we had a couple other pilots in our class, but we also have people from 
a lot of different science or technology backgrounds or folks with PhDs and their name is Joe or Fred or whatever. And, you know, you've got all the pilots are just calling each other call signs and they're like, well, I thought your name was Doug. And it's like, <laughs> no, no, yeah, that it, it's true. That was my birth name, but it's interesting. And yeah, I've had this call sign now for 30 plus years, 35 years. I don't know. I, you know, and you know how it is. You earn your call sign. Either you do something, it's something about your name, your physical characteristics, or you do something dumb in the airplane. So it's neat how it evolves, but yeah, I've had it for a long time. And speaking of those other astronauts, one of the questions I wanted to get back to you earlier on in the conversation. So what was Karen's background real quick? Yeah, good question. You know, astronauts, they're typically two flavors. One, you know, like me, who it kind of evolved and I became an astronaut. You know, I was interested in flying and flew jets and then went to test pilot school. Whereas Karen was the other side of the coin where it was like she knew from the time she was very, very young, like four or five, that she wanted to be an astronaut. She came from an even smaller hometown than I came from. Her hometown, like, has 65 people. Hmm. When she went to college, she went to the University of North Dakota as a mechanical engineer, but then she co opted at NASA for several semesters, and that was her goal. That was her focus, and ended up getting her master's and her PhD from the University of Texas in mechanical engineering. It was uh, thermal systems, and then was hired as an engineer at the Johnson Space Center in like 1997, 98, something like that. And then like some of the other ones in our class applied for that class of 2000 and got picked. And so, yeah, she's had an amazing career. And like I said, she got the fly shuttle and fly station as well. And and met you. Yeah, then managed to have a family in the process. From the time she flew in 2008 until 2020, it was pretty crazy between all the space flights and getting married and having our son. And it's been nice to be able to kind of slow down and catch our breath a little bit. Although anybody who's moved knows that moving is no fun. So we're still suffering the scars from moving. That's from right. Texas, but everything's a lot better now. Well, it's great. I tell you, Doug, it's been really wonderful. You've got an amazing background and from your Marine Corps time, flying Hornets to test to flying the space shuttle to Crew Dragon and now at Northrop Grumman. Really an amazing life you've lived, and it's a great pleasure for me to be able to get you on here and share that with our listeners who are interested in these kinds of endeavors. So I appreciate the time. I really enjoyed it, Matt. It was great to get to know you. And uh, if people are interested in any portion of aviation or space, they should go after it because it's an amazing career. I loved every bit of it. I'm just excited about where it's going a growing industry. So thanks for your insight on that. Enjoy yourself out there in Utah. You bet. Hey, thanks again. All right. Wow. That was really amazing. Hey, Flounder, thanks to you again for doing that. And big thanks to Chunky. (laughs) That's a good one for uh, coming on the show and helping us out. Guy's got a lot of amazing passion and energy and enthusiasm for all this. He sure does. And really an amazing background from Marine Corps pilot to getting into NASA, the test time in there. So it was really an enjoyable conversation, very personable. Just uh, was a wonderful time for me. Well, and there was another, I think, what, 20 minutes of conversation we clipped out that we'll make available for our Patreon subscribers because he talked a little bit more about flight school and being in the uh, two-seat D squadron. And I forget what else you guys covered, but there was a little bit more background. It was really my fault. I just couldn't stop asking him (laughs) questions. So yeah, we'll make that available to Patreon supporters out there. But the rest of the interview was really, it, it really hit the mark. For sure. And it was just so fun to hear names I recognize. I mean, Bob Benkin is married to a UCLA classmate of mine, Megan. And I think she went up on the second she sure did. Dragonfly. Yeah. Yeah. So both of them found love in NASA <laughs> and almost took it to the moon. But what a small world it is. Yeah, it is. I actually stopped and saw them and stayed with them uh, when I was in my very last job in the Navy delivering jets all over the place. And I was always looking for somewhere new to stop. And and she said, oh, come see me in Houston. So went down there and, and I met their son, who's, gosh, obviously much older now, but he was fairly young. And I'm sitting here looking at this you know, one-year-old and I'm thinking, your parents are both PhD astronauts. <laughs> I hope he destined, <laughs> destined for greatness. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't end up a skateboarder, I guess, or something, right? But yeah. anyhow, no, that's awesome. And I'm, I hope they're doing well. And uh, Megan, if you're out there, make sure to say hello once in a while. I always forget to uh, reach out to you. But anyway, awesome. Well, I was really amazed 
you know, having been now at my airline for about five years, that he talked about some of the airline pilot information, or I guess the way they did some of the space shuttle stuff and all that. And that really resonated because I always tell people, I'm not really a pilot anymore. I'm more like an aircraft programmer. Yeah, it's that, you know, way that the system is doing its stuff and you're just influencing how things go. And that was really, I was interested to hear how he talked about Crew Dragon because we see the Dragon capsules going back and forth all the time. It's like, okay, so what does it mean to be a pilot? It was an interesting comment by him that he was probably the only guy or girl who will ever fly the Crew Dragon because he had to do it for right, test points. Right. So that was interesting. I'll tell you the part that really resonated with me was at the end of the space shuttle life, all the systems they kept adding on and putting that burden on the operators because it put <laughs> me right back in the Comcat cockpit, <laughs> having to integrate all the stuff in my head, which could be challenging at times. Were you there when they started having like the little handheld GPS things you guys were putting? Oh, yeah. And that saved my life on some events, low level events. Those were definitely tools of the trade. Was that what caused Torch to be yeah. ejected? Yeah, yeah right? it sure was. So you get what happened? So, a jet so Torch was flying an F 14B. But fortunately, he had a D canopy just because they were form fit function. And so the supply system, that jet happened to have one. And on the D, the D was designed that the seats could go through the canopy. And so the Rio had the GPS, had not taken it off the grab handle before they trapped. And so Torch comes aboard at night. And as he's rolling out in the wires, he's thinking, sweet, that was a nice pass. And next thing he knows, he's in the water because the GPS <laughs> had come off the handle hit the actuator at the top of his ejection seat and blew him through the canopy. Dang. And so he's basically sitting there in the water. And his first thought was, thank God my Rio was there. I had no idea we were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the poor Rio is sitting there like, why did he just eject and am I about to go? Yeah. And right? so the engines are at full military power. He's hitting in the wires. Mm -hmm. They actually ended up doing all kinds of things to try to get the engines to come back to idle so they could get the jet out of the landing area. It was quite the episode. My goodness. That was VF-143. Yeah, I think they finally, some brave chief on a cherry picker or something reached in and brought them back to idle or shut the engines or something. But, yeah, brought okay. the engines back. Yeah, exactly. Well, getting back to space flight, I've not seen Return to Space you mentioned on the interview. Is that worth seeing? I think it really is. It's a nice uh, couple-hour documentary that they have on Netflix, and it was really good at getting into a whole process SpaceX went through all the challenges. Like we said in the episode, it's not easy to launch rockets in space. And so it really shows that, but it shows the determination and the vision and the emphasis on safety, which was really prominent throughout. All right. And then the other one, Among the Stars, which oh, basically yeah. followed Chris Cassidy. It's a multi-episode series on Disney that followed Chris Cassidy. And so it's really got that, it's the human story nice. behind it. Yeah. So it was really great. Yeah, and those are the ones that we all seem to resonate with most. So that's good. Mm. Good. All right. Anything else on uh, your interview with Doug Hurley and where can we follow Chunky on social media, if at all? Yeah. So what I will say is that we didn't quite get into it at the end, but since then I'm following things like, you know, there is competition up there in space. So, you know, I think over the next 10 or 20 years, it's going to become a little more prominent. Space Force has done Space Flag 22-3, which was really about combat in space. Wow. It's not too far into the future that and with contested things like communication satellites and things like that. There's stuff going on all the time, and Space Force is out there protecting our communication systems, our GPS systems, all that kind of stuff. So that's something that uh, I think is going to become a little more prominent. But along with that, so Doug Hurley, just catching up with him, he's been out at the Cape, not as a Cape Crusader, but now in his current capacity where they have the boosters for the Artemis 1 on the SLS. So He's been out there. They're trying to get Artemis 1 launched. Hopefully it'll launch soon and start our return to the moon. And do you happen to know, is he on social media anywhere? I didn't really find him active on social media anywhere. So we'll have to follow up with him. On, and yeah. It looks like he might be on Twitter. I just checked it real quick while you were talking hmm. at Astro underscore Doug. So yeah, he's obviously had some really amazing experiences and big thanks again to him for coming on the show and for you for getting that interview there, uh, Flounder. It was awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you can find him on MySpace. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> speaking of jokes you when you were talking about war in space and the space flag or whatever i was thinking about you remember that james bond movie way back moonraker oh yeah i loved that movie that was a great movie <laughs> i enjoyed that absolutely <laughs> all right tell you what well why don't we wrap up and get back downstairs to the fun at the hill hook I'd like to thank our new patreon strike leads edward parker and nathaniel turner we also have one new mission commander 
Niels Hansen. Niels and I had our good 30 minute debrief conversation the other day, one of the perks for the mission commanders and air bosses. So big shout out to him and everyone who supports the show. As a reminder, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest, and do not necessarily represent the position of NASA or the Department of Defense or its components. Flounder, always great having you back. What are you working on next? I recorded a great conversation on the precision landing mode. That was a lot of fun, enjoyable, looking at where the future of landing on the boat's going. When I was down there on the floor here at Dale Hook flying the F-35 simulator, the T-7 simulator, these things really do almost land themselves. So it was really great to talk to somebody who has been involved in that and operationalizing it. And he's out in the fleet now leading an air wing. And so it's a great conversation that we'll be having released here sometime soon. Well, not too soon because coming up next is our big, what is it? Six part multi-episode series called Fights On. Folks are going to hear some different voices, including one you haven't heard here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast in about a hundred episodes. So we'll be back for that. Flounder, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Jello. All right. And to everyone else, take care, be well. We'll see you next time here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877 Mach 101 That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Landing gear down and locked.